Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm Frank Hoke. I head the Communications and Public Affairs Office here at Rockefeller University. This is, of course, a thrilling day for all of us at Rockefeller, and especially for Dr. Young and his family, his colleagues, and the members of his lab. For the benefit of the journalists in the room today, I want to give you a few details about how we're going to proceed, and then I'll turn the podium over to Rockefeller University's president, Dr. Rick Lifton, who will introduce Dr. Young. Dr. Young will offer some brief comments and then take questions. Um, following the press conference, Dr. Young will be available in his lab for photos and video interviews. Members of the press who would like to shoot additional photos or video in his lab should meet just outside the auditorium after this event, and our staff will escort you to his building. Space is a little tight in the lab, so we may have to take you in smaller groups, but uh, we'll make sure that everyone gets a chance. Um, also, for members of the press, there is updated information about Dr. Young and his work on our website, uh, www.rockefeller.edu, and we will also be posting photos from this event as soon as possible. Uh, if you have not already done so, members of the press, please sign in or leave a card at the uh, registration table outside so that we can let you know when new material becomes available and when the photos are available in particular. Uh, thank you. I'd like to now invite our president, Dr. Rick Lifton, to the podium. Well, good morning. I am absolutely delighted to welcome all of you to this very joyful celebration of science. This morning, the Nobel Committee announced that Michael W. Young has won the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. He shares the prize with Jeffrey Hall and Michael Rosbash of Brandeis University. Together, these really represent a highly deserving trio. Mike is honored for his discoveries of gene mutations and molecular mechanisms governing, governing circadian rhythm. On behalf of the entire Rockefeller University community, let me extend my warmest congratulations to Mike. Mike's extremely innovative science and brilliant experimentation demonstrate how the brain orchestrates altered behavior in response to a changing environment. Discoveries of profound importance uh, which extend well beyond simple uh, circadian rhythm, which is complex enough. The Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology is a towering achievement, and everyone who knows Mike not only recognizes his brilliant contributions to science, but also recognizes his genuine humility and service to science. The universal comment in my inbox this morning has been, I don't know if the Nobel Prize has ever been given to a nicer person. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> when Mike started his laboratory at Rockefeller in 1978, he chose to tackle the daunting question how is the body's circadian rhythm, its sleep-wake cycle, regulated by the brain? To tackle such a complex problem, Mike chose to take a genetic approach, looking for single gene mutations that disrupted the ability of the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster to maintain its normal circadian rhythm. This ultimately res resulted in identification of a slew of genes that regulate the fly's circadian clock. From these individual pieces, Mike then put together the molecular mechanism by which the length of daylight is perceived and translated into periodic gene expression aligned with the circadian cycle, which in turn governs the periodicity of sleep and activity, feeding behavior, and metabolism. The fundamental mechanism elucidated by Mike and his colleagues proves to be evolutionarily conserved throughout the animal kingdom, literally from flies to humans with direct implications for understanding human sleep disorders, the mechanisms of jet lag, and the challenges of working the night shift. This work beautifully embodies the power of great basic science to illuminate our understanding of life on this planet with profound implications for human health and disease. Most recently, Mike and his colleagues have looked at the genetic and molecular underpinnings of sleep and depressive disorders in humans and have identified a common mutation that slows the biological clock. People with this night owl variant of this gene have a longer circadian cycle, making them stay awake uh, late into the night and making it difficult to stay on a 24-hour cycle. 
Mike joined Rockefeller in 1978 and is now the Richard and Jean Fisher Professor and Head of the Laboratory of Genetics at Rockefeller. He received his undergraduate degree in biology in 1971 and his PhD in genetics in 1975, both from the University of Texas at Austin. Following postdoctoral work in biochemistry at Stanford University School of Medicine, where he and I, in fact, shared a laboratory, he was appointed assistant professor at Rockefeller in 1978. Mike was named associate professor in 1984 and professor in 1988, and in 2004, he was named the university's vice president for academic affairs and the Richard and Jean Fisher professor. Mike was an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute from 1987 to 1996. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a, a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. He has won two numerous to count uh, previous awards, including the 2013 Shaw Prize in Life Science and Medicine, the 2013 Wiley Prize in Biomedical Science, the 2012 Massery Prize, the 2012 Canada Gairdner International Award, the 2011 Louisa Gross Horwitz Prize, and the 2009 Peter and Patric Patricia Gruber Foundation Neuroscience Prize. Mike shared virtually all of these prizes with Mike Rosbash and Jeffrey C. Hall, with whom he shares today's Nobel Prize. I'd like to extend my congratulations to Mike and Jeffrey for their fine work. And Mike, congratulations again on this exceptional honor. Please come up and tell us the story. Well, I've heard from so many of you uh, this morning. I can't thank you enough. Uh, all the emails, uh, text messages, attempted phone calls, and I say attempted, <laughs> you can imagine. I'm glad they have three bottles of water up here. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this really does, did take me by surprise. Laurel is my uh, witness. Uh, and uh, I really had trouble even getting my shoes on this morning. Just, just you, know, you know, I'd go and I'd pick up the shoes, and then I'd realize I need the socks, and then I'd realize I need to put my pants on first. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, you get here and see all this, and I guess you, you realize it must be true. Uh, this is, you know, I was saying earlier today, this is, this is a problem that I've had the good fortune to work on uh, for most of my career. It, it actually started uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Texas. And I uh, have to credit uh, Ron Konopka and Seymour Benzer, who had the outstanding insights that uh, maybe it was time to try to get uh, mutations that affected behavior in a model organism. And they chose Drosophila. And that, for myself and for Jeff Hall and for Michael Rosbash has made all the difference. Um, they found mutations that uh, would obliterate sleep-wake cycles in the fly and other circadian rhythms, uh, other mutations that made these clocks seem to run too fast, uh, others that made the clock seem to run too slowly. And in fact, many of their colleagues uh, it kind of shook their heads and wondered if, if something has to be wrong. Uh, Max Delbrook, famously, when being told uh, by uh, Ron Kanaka that he had these mutations, shook his head and said, no, th this can't be true. And he said, we've, got the, we've got the mutations, Max. So this was a, uh, this was a problem that uh, uh, I really became uh, interested in as a graduate student. Uh, uh, Cloning had just uh, begun. I, I went to Stanford, you know, where uh, Rick and I met, not to work on this problem, but just to learn how to work on genes at the molecular level. How could you purify an individual gene? This was remarkable technology. We're still, I can't say how much we've benefited from this. You all know. Uh, but at the time, it was all uh, brand new. and. Uh, you could pick anything in the world to work on. And so we reached out. We saw these, this, this problem, uh, genes and behavior, and, and, a, and a behavior that could be measured, quantified, 
uh, in such a, uh, a clear fashion and thought, well, this is, we're really sticking out our necks, but let's see what we can do with this. And we never imagined, uh, we were hopeful that what we did in the fly would, would uh, pertain uh, more widely. Uh, I don't think we ever really thought uh, a, a beautiful mechanism would emerge in a lifetime. Uh, but then we had, in those days, I think we all had, we didn't realize how fast the tools were developing and how fast uh, science would proceed. Uh, and just like puzzle pieces, the, the genes fell out uh, and, uh, and the way they work together uh, provided this beautiful mechanism that we all now uh, appreciate. And as Rick mentioned, uh, you look for a similar kind of uh, machinery and more complex organisms. First mice, yes, it's there. And then humans, yes, it's there. And then uh, you, you start finding that uh, 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 the mutations are associated with clear patterns of aberrant uh, sleep in, uh, uh, in humans. And you, you, you have this satisfaction that you began 40-something years ago thinking about a problem that uh, 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 was a thought and a hope and a dream, but it has unfolded in a way that uh, just couldn't be imagined in the beginning. So uh, the, the other thing about all of this is I've worked with just a tremendous number of, this is, this is a shared honor. Uh, I've had so many terrific people all along uh, working with me. I, this is not the sort of thing you do on your own. And uh, you know, year after year, people would show up at the door uh, interested in this problem, believing that uh, this was something uh, worthy of working on, and I can't thank them all enough. Uh, every graduate student, every postdoc uh, that's worked with me has, has made such a, a huge uh, difference, and you're all really being recognized today, as, as I hope you, you appreciate. You mentioned the, the aberrant sleep uh, that was associated with the mechanism you came up with. In, in a general sense, uh, what practical payoff has there been, will there be, from your work in terms of medicine? Right. Uh, well, of course, we're just starting with this. But for example, most recently, we've um, realized that about 1% of the population worldwide carries a mutation in one of these clock genes that uh, causes them to have uh, a, a pattern of delayed sleep, severely delayed sleep. And many of these individuals show up in sleep clinics uh, wondering what to do. So we now have a, a molecular basis, a molecular and genetic basis for understanding what that is. And, uh, and um, in this particular case, for example, it's uh, one of the proteins involved that is uh, overactive. Uh, so we have ways of thinking about how we might want to attack uh, a medical problem where, where, uh, where a gene is, is, uh, is hyperactive. But the important thing that we know uh, from all of this is the identity uh, of a mutation that's prevalent in the human population. And uh, uh, this gives us a target uh, to work on. It gives, us, uh, it gives us ways of thinking that we didn't have before about how to, to come to solutions where Previously, we didn't even know that this was an inherited uh, uh, disorder. So I think we're going to run across this over and over again. We see this not only in, in this system, but in so many others. So uh, uh, I, have, I have great optimism about the future in that respect. Don. Mike, um, it might not be obvious, and it's not obvious to me, but why is sleep conserved in evolution from flies all the way to humans? Uh. Well, uh, so, so there are two levels uh, to, to, to my answer. One is uh, sleep is a part of circadian rhythms. Uh, but in addition to sleep, which is controlled by these circadian clocks, uh, uh, deep features of metabolic activity, for example, uh, and other brain functions, uh, almost every tissue in our bodies uh, carries these clocks. 
and they semi-independently control the activities in all of those tissues. And so your liver is programmed to fire up hundreds of genes that are appropriate for using fuel, uh, fuel, but at times when you're supposed to be active and ingesting food. Uh, uh, that, is a, that is a coherence that's built into the system over uh, hundreds of millions of years. Sleep is, uh, uh, the purpose of sleep is something we're, we're, that remains quite mysterious. We're still very interested in this. We've recently been uh, going at this from uh, uh, a slightly different direction, which is to say we know that sleep patterns are controlled by these circadian clocks, but we also know that there is sleep homeostasis, so the number of hours that we sleep uh, appears to be uh, regulated. And we can find mutations that will affect that sleep homeostat, that will cause, for example, a fly to sleep for uh, uh, two-thirds the length of the night instead of a full, uh, a full night of sleep. And those have severe effects on the longevity of those flies. We find that if we manipulate sleep artificially in those flies, if we induce sleep, in some cases by tightly regulating their circadian clocks, we can extend lifespan and sleep in those, in those flies. So while we don't know what it's for, we know it's important. <laughs> This is an online question from Per Snaprud from um, the science magazine Forsnig and Framstug in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, what is your best advice to Swedes having to endure very dark winters? <laughs> <laughs> and also, what will you do to cope with jet lag when you travel to Stockholm? <laughs> <laughs> well, jet lag, jet lag uh, becomes more and more interesting uh, over time. The more we learn about uh, the way circadian clocks operate in different parts of our bodies, the more interesting this problem becomes. Originally, we thought everything was just uh, a part of a brain-based uh, regulation and all the rest of us followed, the rest of our bodies followed suit. But now we know we can actually produce conflicts between different organs in our bodies. And that kind of a conflict appears when you go to Stockholm. Uh, when, I, when, I, when you fly across uh, the Atlantic, uh, within 24 hours, uh, your, your brain, uh, a region of your brain and a, a part of your hypothalamus will uh, probably be almost fully reset within a day of, arising, uh, of, of arriving uh, uh, in Europe. On the other hand, your liver and your lungs and the cells in your skin are much, uh, much delayed in that adaptation. And it can take up to seven days in mouse studies, uh, which is... Uh, where the best evidence for this is. In mouse studies, it can take up to seven days for the complete body to catch up and be agreed on what time it is uh, in the new place. So uh, what we have then is this incoherence, this asynchrony within the system. And we've all, uh, many of, most of us uh, presumably have, have suffered from jet lag uh, to some degree or another. And those, imagine that being a perennial uh, problem. So if I go back to a, an earlier question, for example, where we were looking at individuals that have delayed sleep phase disorder, this night owl disorder, those are individuals whose circadian clocks run at the wrong rate, and therefore they are having a constant bout with jet lag. Every day the world is moving away from their internal clocks, their, uh, and they have to catch up every day, which is, is like flying across uh, a time zone and sitting and readjusting and then doing it again every day. So these are challenges uh, that uh, are produced by things like uh, transcontinental uh, 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 trips. And, and I think this uh, coherence is, uh, is something that we, if you realize uh, that you have all of these uh, clocks listening to different environmental cues, for example, the question, what will I do to try to uh, ameliorate this? Uh, you want to be exposed to natural sunlight, whatever it is in the destination you're going to. That's going to affect your brain. It, it does not necessarily affect uh, your liver. Meal times will affect your liver profoundly. In fact, you can make a mouse where you give them meals uh, in the middle of the day. They're nocturnal. Uh, they'll wake up and eat that meal every day in the middle uh, of the day. Go back 
uh, go back to sleep and then get up uh, at night and, and they'll be active all night long. And you look at the clocks in different parts of their bodies and they're out of sync. They're much as we would imagine uh, in that state, uh, but perpetually as long as, you, as long as you keep that experiment going. So uh, uh, meal times, exposure to light, and down the road I'm sure uh, there will be pharmacological uh, solutions to some of these problems that make sense because we know what the target should be. We know what the elements of these clocks are and that's where the biggest, that's where the adjustments are coming from in the first place. Oh, the short day length, the short day length, yes. So, so we put our, you know, when we do our experiments, we, we uh, when we really want to know what effect a mutation has on circadian rhythm, we put, we put our uh, fruit flies or those that work with mice, put our mice into constant darkness. And uh, the remarkable you, thing you see is that they continue to motor along on their intrinsic internal uh, circadian rhythm. So most of our flies have roughly 24-hour rhythms, and they will go for their whole lives, showing that 24-hour rhythm without any more exposure to light. Uh, it's not quite 24 hours. It's going to be off by maybe a half an hour or so. But uh, they, will, they will show that rhythm for life. The mutants will show an altered, uh, a much altered rhythm. If we're in a, if we're in a, a situation where uh, we're at a, a high latitude, so that we have these very long days uh, or very long nights, then for part of the year there is a sort of a free run going on where there's going to be an increased conflict between your internal clock, if it's, since it's slightly off 24 hours, and yet, you know, the clock on the wall that tells you when to show up at work is buzzing along at exactly 24 hours. So there's going to be a, uh, uh, a difference between what your internal clock is saying and what the clock on the wall is saying. And over day after day, that's uh, going to produce problems unless you have strong cues about what the environment is trying to tell you about 24 hours, uh, which uh, again are things like meal times, uh, exposure to light. You override this to some extent by getting up and exposing yourself to light and meal times on a 24-hour clock, externally derived rather than an internal clock. During the day, uh, the long days uh, in higher latitudes, if you were a fly, you would become arrhythmic because light destroys one of the key components of the clock uh, that just causes it to stop. It, re it begins to reaccumulate when the lights go off again, and that produces a kind of a push-pull mechanism in, this, uh, uh, in these clocks. So a fly, uh, if really left in constant darkness for six months, it would be arrhythmic uh, for six months. Uh, of course, it's not constant uh, or constant light. It's not constant light so much as there is an oscillation in the intensity of light, and so there would be some cue that is coming from that. But there is a challenge at high latitudes, and I, I think uh, uh, the advice there is you really do want to pay attention to uh, in training cues, cues that will keep you on this 24-hour societal uh, rhythm, which largely things like food, drink, and light. For those of you that aren't part of our community, I just want to personally congratulate Mike and say this gentleman is one of the kindest, most generous, and helpful persons on campus. So good guys do win ball games. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mary Beth. Mary Jean, thank you. Second thing I want to raise is um, Mike and I have talked scientifically for years about stress. Uh, I studied the biology of addictive diseases, and we know that one of the greatest factors leading to development and perpetuation of specific addictive diseases is atypical stress. And Mike interacting with our group has encouraged us to look at clock and pair and all his other genes and found uh, most expectedly, according to Mike, that these are deranged by drugs of abuse and we're now looking in humans as well to see if any of these are abnormal. But you may have mentioned it, but I think the derangement of the human stress homeostasis by a derangement of circadian rhythms and clock is extraordinarily important in society and in a variety of brain diseases. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, um, an extension of that, and again, talking about medical uh, prospects, one of the things that, uh, 
is available to us today that hasn't been in the past is the if you if you have uh, single gene mutations that are associated with a disorder in a significant number of individuals. And you can study those individuals. If you have uh, a relationship with those subjects that allows you to study them, then you can ask deep questions about other medical problems. And I think this is maybe one of the most important things that can be uh, pursued at this point. For years, decades, it's been assumed that there are connections between depression and sleep. Uh, uh, but those are anecdotal. Uh, there, there's been no clinical way to really uh, connect those two. We now have methods to uh, search through uh, the genome, of find mutations uh, that are uh, uh, carried by significant numbers of individuals, um, and, uh, and ask questions not only about their sleep, but about other important issues. Metabolic issues as well. There, there are, all the animal uh, studies that are going on suggest there is deep regulation of metabolism, and we know metabolic disorders appear to be uh, responsive to uh, sleep patterns and patterns of, of feeding, more so than, than, uh, uh, than would have been imagined just a few years ago. So these are all these are all coming together in ways that I think uh, uh, the horizon looks very bright, I think, uh, for medicine and human biology because of this. When you see metabolic disorders like Well, obesity uh, and, and, all of its, uh, and all of its trimmings. Uh, uh, there, are, there are, for example, experiments by other labs that have, uh, that have gone on. This is one of the things that's been really uh, uh, so pleasing about beginning work so long ago and then finding others excited by it and taking it in new directions. But we have colleagues uh, in labs that are working on mice that are looking at uh, the effects of different patterns of feeding on body weight. And uh, this is uh, published work uh, independently done now by several labs that indicate that Strikingly, the same number of calories has a different effect on body weight depending on whether it's provided ad lib or only under certain restricted conditions over a few hours a day. An animal that eats only 12 hours a uh, day and consumes a particular number of calories will, will fare better than an animal that has the same number of calories but eats them ad lib. So there are deep mysteries about how, how these rhythms um, uh, are, are producing such, such, uh, such uh, strong uh, responses, but I think the, the outlook is extremely good and almost certainly uh, 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 we'll learn much more about this uh, with regard to human medical conditions uh, in the not too distant future. Great, well, if there are no further questions, Mike, I think you can uh, appreciate from uh, today's discussion and the outpouring uh, uh, what a popular choice uh, this year's uh, Nobel Prize is. And congratulations once again. Yeah, I just thought I, I, I'd, uh, I'd like to say one other thing, and that is, uh, you know, I've been at Rockefeller since 1978, and I don't think there's any place in the world uh, that would have provided me with uh, the way forward on, uh, on this, on this uh, adventure. Uh, it's not just uh, that you have uh, material advantages at Rockefeller. It's it's such an unusual committee, uh, a community. I mean, I, I this is uh, 
the last few minutes have, have underscored this. Uh, it's such a wonderful place to have uh, worked and I hope to be still working many years from now. <laughs> so thank you all, you've really made, made all the difference.